Why do MBA students learn microeconomic theory? Because this is required at a lot of MBA programs, and a lot of times it can seem very pedantic, it can seem very unconnected to the real world, but it's not. Um, if it's taught right, microeconomic theory is absolutely essential to the kinds of things that MBA students will go on to do. So in this video, I would like to give an example of how microeconomic theory can be used in business decision making. And I think this is going to highlight why you're learning this if you're an MBA student and why it's useful to build this into the way you think about things because you will have a much more powerful way of analyzing real world problems and interpreting data. All right, so first of all, what are MBA students training to do? And they're basically training to have arguments with their colleagues in the businesses that they will run. Like we're imagining C-suite arguments where they're analyzing complex situations, making business decisions, and there's a lot of data they're looking at that perhaps tell conflicting stories. So I'm going to set this up with a story about a conversation, an argument, that is probably actually really common in the business world. And I'll show you then how microeconomic theory can help you solve it or help you frame the way you go about processing information. Here's the setup. There's going to be two people, Elizabeth and Ed, who are founders of a company, say. Let's say they're, they're in a partnership and this is a tech company that's developing an app. And of course, the success of the app is going to depend on how many people take up the app and the growth rate of this app. Network effects, in other words, are at play in whatever business they're trying to run. Now, they have received a certain amount of funding and that's sort of fixed. For a period of time, they're not going to be able to apply for new funding. They have to go out and prove that they can actually make progress in the business with this fixed amount of funding. But they also kind of know that six months from now or a year from now, they're going to need more funding if this company is going to grow in the way they hope it's going to grow. The decision they're trying to make is this. Do they invest that money in advertising or do they invest that money in making the app better and working through the kinks in the app that people get frustrated with? And Elizabeth and Ed have different opinions about this. Elizabeth much prefers to invest it in making the app better. And part of the reason she prefers this is because she knows a few people who have tried to use their app recently who got really frustrated with some of the kinks in the code and these people gave her feedback that the app was not easy to use and so they stopped using it. So this is of course anecdotal, but her intuition tells her they're going to make more money if they invest money working out those kinks so that the new people who come onto the app have a better experience and are more likely to stay. Ed, on the other hand, has a different viewpoint. He thinks most of the money should be invested in advertising. He's looking at the numbers and he sees most people who try the app stay or at least a pretty high percentage who try the app stick with it. So he thinks those anecdotes from Elizabeth are not that meaningful. Now, of course, Anne has a response to that. Anne says, well, she thinks it's a waste to invest money in advertising when some of the people coming in from that advertising are gonna get frustrated with the app and stop using it because the code isn't perfectly smooth. And of course, he has some other arguments. He says, well, that would be really expensive for us to invest in uh, working out the kinks because we have three developers who are both really excited about the app and they're willing to work for a lower wage than most developers. And he knows if we go out and try to hire new developers, we're gonna have to pay a much higher wage. Okay, that's the general dilemma they're in. And they're having this argument back and forth. Each of them has a different intuition about how to spend the money that they've gotten. So how do they solve this problem? And we all know that it's not going to be useful for just like the strongest personality to win that battle. Both of them have skin in the game to figure out which of these is the actual right best approach. And they want to do this in a way that utilizes data in a way that's carefully thought through and they want some tools for helping them get past this argument between them. 
Okay, so the first tool in microeconomic theory that should always be on the mind of business leaders is just the general concept of diminishing marginal benefit and increasing marginal cost. So let's draw some graphs that will help us think through what, uh, what arguments might these two be making and how might those arguments be honed and refined if we present them using the classic microeconomic theory graphs. Okay, so here's a few graphs that have already come up. Now, one of the classic graphs in microeconomic theory is the increasing marginal cost graph. And Ed has accurately identified the fact that the first few developers they hire are likely to be willing to work for a lower wage. These are developers who are excited about this particular app. They feel that this app is going to change the world. They're excited to use the application. So maybe they'll work for a lower wage. Um, but after you've hired the first few workers, let's say it's uh, one, but after you've hired the first few workers who are willing to work for a low wage because they're excited about your company, you're going to have to sort of raise the wage of that fifth worker because this person has many other opportunities that this person finds equally exciting as your app and you have to outbid those other companies. And what that may mean is that you not only have to pay this person a higher wage, but also have to raise the wage for these other people so that there's equality so that these people don't get mad about the higher wage for this person. And so there's going to be this increasing at the margin cost to hiring developers. That means that when you look at the data, how much are you paying your developers? You can't just look at how much did you pay the last developer you hired. You have to consider that at some point there's going to be this increasing marginal cost to take into account. So this is one of his arguments. It maps well onto this concept. And this gets across the idea that when you look at data, you shouldn't just be thinking about that data in its current form. You should be thinking about which direction is the data likely to go as we expand our business? Is, is this diminishing at the margin or increasing at the margin? And microeconomic theory tells you that costs tend to increase at the margin, benefits tend to decrease at the margin, and figuring out where are you on this curve is going to make a huge difference if you want accurate projections. Now, Anne um, has properly identified something related to diminishing marginal benefit, which is that um, your advertising dollars are going to hit the people who are the best match for your app first. Right? There's different ways of targeting uh, populations for, for advertising, and you're going to choose the populations best matched with your app to begin with, right? That's just a smart business choice. So there's going to be a very high marginal benefit of each advertising dollar early in the process. Once you've reached people who are a natural fit for your product, you have to start broadening who you're advertising to, and a lower percent of them are going to be interested naturally in your product. Meaning, as you, as you increase your advertising spending, there's going to be lower and lower marginal benefit to each advertising dollar. And of course, this is true because you're being strategic. If you advertised randomly and didn't try to target one specific audience, then this wouldn't be true. This is basically true if there's good management in a company. And the question you have to ask when you're increasing your advertising budget is if you're looking at a piece of data, which is uh, what's the cost per, per customer, cost for acquiring a new customer, that data is based on your current advertising budget, your current advertising strategy. So it may look like there's a high marginal benefit to advertising. Like for every advertising dollar you spend, there's a big increase in the number of people who are attracted to your product. But you have to acknowledge that as you increase your advertising budget, eventually uh, there's going to be a lower marginal benefit for every dollar you spend there's fewer and fewer people who are willing to take up your app and she is emphasizing this when she is or at least she could emphasize this when she interprets the data about acquiring new customers so mbas should always have this in mind whenever they interpret data they should be 
thinking about when will that benefit the customer gained per advertising dollar, when will that see diminishing marginal benefits? And what are indicators that we might already be experiencing diminishing marginal benefit? In which case, if they're trying to resolve this problem, they may actually want to look at what was going on in their company a few months ago versus what's happening right now. Like if we look at advertising dollars from the past month, is the advertising as effective as it was six months ago? In which case, one way that MBAs can consider this idea of diminishing marginal benefit is to look at data from different periods in the growth of the company, where early on there might be high marginal benefit, later on there might be lower marginal benefit because you've already sort of found all the customers that are best matched to your app. There's also this theory, and you may have seen this in, in the following format. Okay, so you may have seen this where uh, in the development of an app, there are the early adopters who are often the people who are on the cutting edge and maybe they're willing to put up with a few kinks in the product. They know that the developers are gonna work out those kinks eventually. These are the early adopters. And then you have the second stage of adopters and maybe you can divide this population into six parts where the st second stage uh, they know the early adopters, they're excited to, to adopt it, but they need a few months of hearing about it before they're willing to adopt it. And then there's the next group, the next group, and you've got the late adopters that are just not very into tech, and maybe they'll adopt it if everybody else has adopted it, but otherwise they won't. So there's basically different groups of people that you bring into your company at different times. And these groups are going to have different characteristics. For example, the early group may be willing to stick with the app for six months while it works through its kinks. They, they, they're not scared away by the frustrations of parts of the app that don't work. So maybe this graph is people that you bring onto the scene where you've got your early adopters out here and you've got your later adopters out here. And of course, you know that in microeconomic theory, you basically practice thinking of graphs as people lined up on an axis. That's one common cognitive tool to use when you analyze things using microeconomic theory. All right, so this person is one of the early adopters and they're willing to spend six months. This is duration with the app that you're willing to stick with it while it's difficult to use. So maybe it's six months for the first person, maybe it's five and a half months for the second person, but when you get to these people out here, this person is only willing to stick with it one month um, before they give up out of frustration. And maybe beyond a certain point, people will only stick with it a couple of days before they get frustrated and give up the product. This graph, was, of course, is a graph of the marginal benefit. So it's, it would be, in other words, the derivative of a graph like this. And this graph is going to be obviously something that Elizabeth might want to bring up in her arguments that she, she might say, well, you know what? Yeah, the first few people stuck with the app and we do have some data that's showing us that a group of people who joined six months ago were willing to stick with the app even with all of its frustrations. But she's starting to hear from a group of people who are recent adopters who are much more likely to be frustrated and leave the company or, or get the app off their phone. So she might make this argument that yes, there is some data that people stick with it, but that data does not take into account this uh, diminishing marginal benefit property of people as we bring them into the, into the fold of our company. I've just explained how it's really useful when you're having arguments within companies to frame things in terms of diminishing marginal benefit. And this relates to data. This relates to how you interpret data and how you project data moving forward that you always need to be thinking about when is there diminishing marginal benefit and increasing marginal cost or else you're going to misproject profits, you're going to misproject costs, you're going to misproject the probability that customers will stick with you. All of those numbers that matter a lot for the long run success of the company, those depend on you having a strong intuition for these shapes of graphs. 
All right, now I was going to do a microeconomic theory model. I think this is long enough for one video, so I think what I'm going to do is have a part two. But just to let you know what's coming in the next video. These two people, as they have their argument, can actually gain a lot of insight by building a model. And in particular, this insight is going to help them get inside the heads of their customers. You may have heard that the, the company that knows the customer the best is the company that succeeds, right? Business people basically have to be really in tune with their customers, the customer's desires, frustrations, needs, and all that. And microeconomic theory is actually a great tool for doing that. So I'll post a link below to the other video I'm about to do. I wanted to keep these separate just so that just so that my videos aren't too long, but it's coming.